So, here in this beautiful diagram, you can see the figures. The design was, why don't we then go to the art of rhetoric, which is the latter part of the dialogue. It has four parts, if you just hold back the introduction and the conclusion. The first speech, the second speech, the third, or the second of Socrates's, and this is the art of rhetoric. So the thought was, wouldn't it be interesting for us to take this, the art of rhetoric, and apply it? Apply it because these two are taken together, because it's, they fit together, and they're both a response from Lysias' speech that Phaedrus picks up. And this is Socrates' speech. So therefore we have two tasks before us, or three, right? Art of rhetoric, its application, right? to Socrates' speech, the second speech, and to this whole thing. Now, as in every dialogue, the introductions are always important, and so too the conclusion. But the conclusion here echoes the beginning. And as you know, uh, if you look at the last section, it's a prayer. <coughs> It's, it's the only Socratic or Socrates' prayer, and it starts with Ophile Pan, and that's the way the dialogue begins. Ophile, right? And it's playing on both ends. Because the art of rhetoric is a prayer. That's what it really is. It's a prayer. The art of rhetoric is a prayer. But let's hold on. Now, I thought, therefore, we could get someone to read the prayer and see what we can see in it and then jump right through the whole thing. That's what I thought we'd do tonight. Okay, any questions before we jump in? Okay. Um, now, if we get some readers, there has to be a rule. Slow readers. Ah, you want to try? All right. Go right ahead. Oh, let me get my own stuff. Put it down here somewhere. Oh, there it is. I have a couple extra copies of the paper. Extra copies. Anybody need them? Where does he want us to start? The very beginning or the, the prayer? Yeah, the prayer at the end? Oh, you prayed it. And what's that before? Because he didn't like him when he last one. Oh, Now, um, we have a reader. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's using it in the lobe, but it's the last paragraph in the page. <laughs> the last paragraph? Look at this. Yeah. It doesn't have a text, she has a gleaming computer. I mean, this is a wild world, man. This is a real strange world. And the printout. 
Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I was going to find it in that. O oh, beloved Pan, and all the other gods of this place, grant to me that I be made beautiful in my soul within, and that all external possessions be in harmony with my inner man. May I consider the wise man rich, and may I have such wealth as only the self-restrained man can bear or endure. Do we need anything more, Phaedrus? For me, that prayer is enough. <coughs> okay. Um, as you can see in this beautiful picture, there's the soul. <laughs> Right. And uh, somewhat hidden by the soul. There it is. Okay. So, what do you make of the prayer? Come on, come on. Is it a peculiar kind of prayer? Is it a petition? Is it a sacrifice? If he didn't say this was a prayer, would you say, oh, yes, it's a prayer? Sure. I would. I would. I, I don't, uh, and you were going to look up Thomas Taylor, I see. Go ahead. Who or what is Pan? Pan the God? I don't know what Pan mm -hmm. is. Oh. The God, the God of what? To all. The God of all? Yeah. With a smile on his face. <laughs> kind of a joyous Pam and Barbara was waiting for you to ask since she has a, a good view of Pam actually I, I don't I think don't you I thought you would did don't no okay <laughs> of what well but Pierre's an interesting joke because Pan means all in Greek right and Pan Ops that we studied the name for Hermes last week yeah all seeing has contains the word Pan. I'm not connecting necessarily the two, yeah. but uh, yeah. So that's worth knowing. Is okay. Come on, push it. Yes. Go ahead. Want to read Thomas Taylor's? Then? Sure. O oh, beloved Pan, and all the other gods who are residents of this place, grant that I may become beautiful within and that whatever I possess externally may be friendly to my inward attainments. Well, that's different. Oh, wow. Grant also that I may consider the wise man as one who abounds in wealth, and that I may enjoy that portion of gold which no other than a prudent man is able either to bear or properly manage. Do we require anything else, Phaedrus? For to me, it appears that I have prayed tolerably well. <coughs> hmm. uh, that I be made beautiful in my soul is, all, uh, is it doesn't it doesn't it's not the same as I may become beautiful, which means it would become it, that effort would have to come from him. But made sounds like it's coming from something else. Well, be made still could be becoming. Oh, yeah, right. Be, becoming is closer. The Greek is becoming. No. But it comes from himself if it's becoming. Mm -hmm. made. So what does he want? Basically asking for a level share. Not more, not less. Sufficient. I guess you'd say that he wants his soul to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. That too. Oh, that's not a, a trade, right? And all my external possessions be in harmony with my inner man. So whatever is around here, Right. He wants it to be, inner man is another word for soul, another idea of soul, right? 
all of this must be in harmony with him, with that inner man. What does Thomas have to harmony? Uh, friendly. Right, I like that. Right. Friendly to my inner attainment, uh, inward attainments, mm -hmm. as opposed to inner man. Well, it's just what, it, it seems to me it's just that it be made friendly right. to what is within me. Because you're going to consider a wise man truly rich. And he only wants as much wealth as a uh, temperate man can bear or endure. endure. So from And uh, he's often broke. Yes. Uh, At five, uh, there's an interesting quote at around um, 274 C. Number again? 274 C. Or in our book, 561. Do you know how you can speak, how you can act or speak about rhetoric so as to please God best? <coughs> Not at all, do you? Well, I can tell you something. I have heard of the ancients. But whether it's true, they only know. But if we ourselves should find it out, should we care any longer for human opinions? A ridiculous question. But tell me what you say what but tell me what you say you have heard. Look. Do you know how you can act or speak about rhetoric so as to please God best? Mm. Now, is the prayer... <clears throat> Look, however it is, you're, however you would answer that interesting question, which is, how can you speak or act about rhetoric so as to please God? The prayer is an example of rhetoric. Let's assume the prayer it fits the art of rhetoric. Therefore, we're getting close to saying, are we not, that the art of rhetoric is a way of offering prayers to the gods. Mm. And I have a way of reasoning that I can get support for. Go ahead. See? <laughs> What's the Greek word for rhetoric? Logon. Is that great? Again? Rhetoric. That's the way home. <laughs> so look here, what do we have? Okay. How do you know how you can act or speak about rhetoric so as to please God best? Oh, question. Whatever that's going to be, can we then apply it to the prayer? Because the prayer should be something that might please the gods best. Mm -hmm. Example, therefore, of the art of rhetoric. Well, look here. Therefore, we do not agree what we need is a couple of people to read it, and I can listen. All right. I'm always better at listening. Why? 
because I see there's going to be a long paragraph, <laughs> and I'll duck. I'll read, though. I like reading, <laughs> if that's okay. Oh, okay. Need someone else to play the other role? Thank you. I have a different version of so Well, sometimes that's fun. <laughs> no, really. Mind? You know, sometimes it's fun. Oh, I don't okay. know. Do you want to stay consistent? Or, uh, or whatever you prefer. When, no, no, no. We don't have that You're one. reading, so you can call you the shot. Call the shot. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stay consistent. Okay, go on. Yeah. Right? The reader ought to be able to call the shot. Okay. Yeah. I'll just listen. That's what I was saying. You're on the bottom of 561, I presume. I have a page. Should I, do we begin? Five sixty one. Yeah, who do you want to be? I'll start around. Okay, go ahead. I heard then that at Nocritus in Egypt was one of the ancient gods of that country, the one whose sacred bird is called the Ibis, and the name of the god himself was Thuth. He it was who invented numbers and arithmetic and geometry and astronomy, also draughts and dice and most important of all, letters. <clears throat> now the king of all Egypt at that time was the god Thamus, who lived in the great city of the upper region, which the Greeks called the Egyptian Thebes, and they called the god himself Amon. To him came Thuth to show his invention, saying that they ought to be imparted to the other Egyptians. But Thamus asked what use there was in each, and as Thuth enumerated their uses, expressed praise or blame according as he approved or disproved. Hmm, interesting. The story what goes that Thomas and many things said many things to Thuth in praise or blame of the various arts, which it would take too long to repeat. But when they came to the letters, this invention, O king, said Thuth, will make the Egyptians wiser and will improve their memories, for it is an elixir of memory and wisdom that I have discovered. But Thamus replied, replied, Most ingenious Thuth, one man has the ability to beget arts, but the ability to judge of their usefulness or harmfulness to their users really belongs to another. And now you, who are the father of letters, have been led by your affection to ascribe to them a power the opposite of that which they really possess. For this invention will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn to use it, because they will not practice their memory. Their trust in writing, produced by external characters, which are no part of themselves, will discourage the use of their own memory within them. You have invented an elixir not of memory, but of reminding. And you offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom. For they will read many things without instruction, and will therefore seem to know many things when they are, for the most part, ignorant and hard to get along with, since they are not wise, but only appear wise. Socrates, you easily make them... Louder. Sleep. More, Socrates. more. Right, good, we're good, more. <laughs> you easily make up stories of Egypt or any country you please. They used to say, my friend that the words of the oak in the holy place of Zeus at Dodona were the first prophetic utterances. The people of that time, not being so wise as you young folks, were content. You young folks were content in their simplicity to hear an oak or a rock, provided only it spoke the truth. But to you, 
Perhaps it makes a difference who the speaker is and where he comes from. For you do not consider only whether his words are true. For you do not consider only whether his words are true or not. Your rebuke is just, and I think the Theban is right in what he says about letters. He who thinks, then, that he has left behind him any art in writing, and he who receives it in the belief that anything in writing will be clear and certain, would be an utter simple person and in truth ignorant of the prophecy of Ammon. Ammon. If he thinks written words are of any use except to remind him who knows the matter, who knows the matter about which they are written. Very true. Boop, there's a volume control at the end of that table. You can just push it. <laughs> Very true. <Yeah. laughs> Writing, Phaedrus, has this strange quality and is very like painting. For the creatures of painting stand like living beings. But if one asks them a question, they preserve a solemn silence. <coughs> and so it is with the written words. You might think they spoke as if they had intelligence. But if you question them, wishing to know about their sayings, they always say only one and the same thing. And every word, when once it is written, is bandied about, bandied about, alike among those who understand and those who have no interest in it. Ooh, I didn't understand that sentence. <laughs> and every word, when once it is written, is bandied about, alike among those who understand and those who have no interest in it. And it knows not to whom to speak or not Push to speak. More Come oh, on. okay. When ill-treated or un justly reveled, reviled, it always needs its father to help it, for it has no power to protect or help itself. You are quite right about that, too. Now tell me, <coughs> is there not another kind of speech or word which shows itself to be the legitimate brother of this bastard one, both in the manner of its beginning and its better and more powerful nature? What is the word and the kind of forgotten, as you say? The word which is written with intelligence in the mind of the learner, which is able to defend itself and knows to whom it should speak, and before whom to be silent. You mean the living and breathing word of him who knows, of which the written word may justly be called the image. Exactly. Now tell me this. Would a sensible husbandman who has seeds which he cares for and which he wishes to bear fruit Plant them with serious purpose in the heat of summer in some garden of Adonis and delight in seeing them appear in beauty in eight days? Or would he do that sort of thing when he did it at when he did it at all, only in play and for amusement? Would he not, when he was in earnest, follow the rules of hub husbandry, plant his seeds in fitting ground? and be pleased when those which he has sowed reach their perfection in the eighth month. Yes, Socrates, he would, as we say, act in that way when in earnest, and in other way only for amusement. And shall we suppose that he who has knowledge of the just and the good and the beautiful has less sense about his seeds than the husbandman? By no means. Then he will not, when in earnest, write them in ink sowing them through a pen with words which cannot defend themselves by argument and cannot teach the truth effectually. No, at least <clears throat> probably not. No. The gardens of letters he will, it seems, plant for amusement and will write when he writes to treasure up reminders for himself. When he comes to the forgetfulness of old age, and for others who follow the same path. And he will be pleased when he sees them putting forth tender leaves. When others engage in other amusement, refreshing themselves with banquets and kindred entertainments, he will pass the time in such pleasures as I have suggested. A noble pastime, Socrates. Uh, what? I didn't understand that. What? A noble pastime, Socrates and a contrast to those base pleasures. The pastime of the man who can find amusement in discourse, 
telling stories about justice and the other subjects of which you speak. Ah. Yes, Phaedrus, so it is. But in my opinion, serious discourse about them is far nobler. When one employs the dialectic method and plants and sows in a fitting soil intelligent words. Soul. Soul? Fitting soul. What did I? Fitting soul. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and so, well, <laughs> fitting, okay. Yeah. So, sows in a fitting soul intelligent words which are able to help themselves and him who planted them. <laughs> which are not fruitless, but yield seed from which there, there spring up in other minds, other words, capable of continuing the process forever, and which make their possessor happy to the farthest possible limit of human happiness. Yes, that is far nobler. And now, Phaedrus, since we have agreed about these matters, we, have decide, we can decide the others. What others? <laughs> Those which brought us to this point, through our desire to investigate them. For we wish to examine into the reproach against Lysias. Okay. Okay. Um, no. What does this mean? And what can, how can we use what we just read to answer that. <coughs> it's about rhetoric, right? It's not just rhetoric, it's about rhetoric, right? How to speak about rhetoric so as to please the gods. And now we went through a whole multi-sections, new subject. So this is another case where Socrates drops the ball and he didn't develop anything that we can bring together to solve that question. Or... Or he did. Well, what are we, how are you going to show it? Hopefully by example. Well, go ahead. Well, I mean... Yeah. And you can get as many people as you can on your side. Okay. Oh, do you have the question? Got well, the question. Well, how did, you know, I'm, well. We just read this. We started with this. Mm -hmm. We're interested in knowing it because we certainly would like to please God's best when we talk about rhetoric. We wondered about whether or not that last prayer of Socrates might be an example of rhetoric. So if we knew about rhetoric, we could then apply it, could we not? Yeah. I mean, how can we say his prayer is an example of rhetoric unless we have some fairly good idea what rhetoric is? Agree? Uh, or what he just said. <laughs> well, you want to apply it also to what he just said? That will be another, that will be another task. Well, I mean, yeah, if, if jump in. Yeah. Um, isn't the key, you know, the idea in the prayer that he is trying to cleanse his soul to be the fairest possible? Oh, I always think so. Okay, and in his Why definition... Why well, it's not okay. If you ask whether it's possible, I'll say, so, yeah, it's possible. Make it stronger than merely asking me whether it's possible. No, no, but what, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that the line, the dialectician selects a soul of the right type. Okay. Okay. Ad, can and you tell us the stuff? Hold it. Give, just give us the Stephanus number that you're oh, on, that's, please. Uh, e, uh, all right, so we're all together. E I've got, you know, a another translation, but the, the issue for me is that the cleansing, you know, the effect upon the soul in terms of the art of rhetoric is what he's trying to impress, just as the story, you know, of Thomas Amon was telling Thuth, you know, you're nuts, it's kind of not going to affect okay. people's reading. Okay, look, watch, watch on it. Okay. Can you tell us where you're reading, because we want to go from 274C down to where we just stopped off. Okay, this is 276E. 276E. 
Thank you. Okay. Hold it. You said E. E. E as an elephant. Do it again, please. E as an elephant. E as in eclairs. Elephant. <laughs> I don't know elephants. Okay, eclairs. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Please read for us. Okay. Yes, indeed, dear Phaedrus, but far more excellent, I think, is the serious treatment of them, which employs the art of dialectic. The dialectician selects a soul of the right type, and in it he plants and sows his words founded on knowledge. Words which can both defend themselves, or defend both themselves and him who planted them. Words yeah. uh, which, instead of remaining barren, contain a seed. Okay. D now go back to your, your original statement, then. This okay, is an so In terms of the prayer... You were raising the point whether this is part of a purification or... Yes, but what I'm trying to say is that that's the, the issue of the art of rhetoric, that the prayer is asking for... Linda, originally you said this is an example of purification, so I asked you for the quote, you had a great quote, all right, does it do that? Does, does the prayer do that? Or no, does pardon the quote? me. Does the, your quote 276E show the idea of purification or a cleansing? Take a look. Take a look again. No. No. What no. does it show? It shows that the, the issue is the effect of the art of rhetoric right. upon the soul. Yeah, okay. Watch now. How many points can you find in that paragraph that he is making? Come on. How many points so we can pull them out? And what does it assume? And what does it assume? Jump in and tell us. Well, it assumes that the, the person who is teaching and using the art of rhetoric is having a positive effect upon the soul of the one who is receiving it. So, there is no doubt about what you're saying, but there's more in the quote than you're telling me, so I have to get other people to help me pull it out of the quote. Well, right. Right, look here. Take a look. Take a minute out. How many points is he making in that quote? Yes, Phaedrus, <clears throat> so it is. But in my opinion, serious discourse about them is far nobler when one employs the dialectical method and plants and sows in a fitting soul intelligent words, which are able to help themselves, right? And him who planted them, which are not fruitless, but yield seed from which they spring up in other minds, other words, capable of continuing the process forever, and which make their possessor happy uh, to the furthest possible limit of human happiness. Why don't you we're going to line them up? Isn't that an extent? Well, well, let me just check. Uh, you you, you want to be happy? A I little bit or a lot of it? A lot. Half a bit? No. The furthest? 100%. 100%. Is that what he's arguing for? Mm -hmm. Right? He's arguing, is he not for that? <laughs> to the furthest most limit? The furthest possible limit of human happiness? Hey, happiness.
That's a peak. Right? He said, hey, I'll tell you guys how to get there. Does this paragraph, though, does it even have anything to do with rhetoric? Because he's, it sounds like he's contrasting the dialectic method True. to rhetoric. Yeah. Because he's saying that this is much nobler and the Vedas of the exit is far nobler. Far nobler than what he said, what he called an old pastime before that. Look here, look here. So he's nobler. applying... Right. He's applying the dialectic method. What's interesting, right? Plants and sows in a fitting soul. Hey, not just any. A fitting soul. Ah. <clears throat> Intelligent words. Right. Hey, a real logos. <coughs> right. Right. Intelligent words. Which are able to help themselves. <laughs> That's the best kind. Right? Best kind. You don't have to water it. <laughs> They'll help they themselves. Sir. Yeah. Uh, a quick question here to the people who, who read the Greek. In, in my lesser translation by Hamilton, it's not saying intelligent words. It's saying uh, it sows in truths accompanied by knowledge. No. Uh, no. No. We do. But that's why we, we want to use every translation we can and then get people who want to help in the group so we can see all the different ways in which you can express it. Absolutely. Right, you have a different translation. That's a, so yeah. I'm just reading now. Yeah, yeah. And you have one. Right. And Thomas Taylor and someone can make up another. Yeah, well, let's go for every one of them. Well, no, the reason, I, the reason I, I'm going with the knowledge that I, I like this one here, too, is because... Um, Right now I'm tracking the Nino a little bit, and there he's making the distinction between knowledge and right opinion, and how knowledge, the difference between them, the statues that will fly away, right? So that knowledge stays with the person who has it, whereas right opinion is fleeting, mm -hmm. which would fit in with what he's saying here. You're sowing in truths that will stay and benefit the person mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they can defend each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, look. So, which are able to help themselves and him who planted them. So they're both being helped, are they not? He's the planter. So he's being helped too by implanting the seeds. What do they do? But yield seed from which they can spring up in other minds, other words. Wow! Right, 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 right. So they bear fruit. Match. Right. A strange kind of fruit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But they yield seeds from which they spring up in other minds, other words. Capable of, hey, these words can go on forever. Is that correct? Come on. Yeah. A certain kind of words can do it. Only a certain kind of words can do it. Yeah. Right. <coughs> and these go on forever. What happens? Makes them happy. As a matter of fact, that should be <laughs> up here, right? Yes. The, the, the 
fullest capable state of happiness. Ah. Right. Now, would you agree in this paragraph he's using ideas which he developed earlier in greater length? We can go back and pick up the planter and the sewing, can we not? So we can add to it, by the way, because there's some things he didn't include here that are worthwhile. If you go up a couple of 270, 276B, that's where 276B is where... 276B? I'll go. 276B! Go ahead. I... Socrates asked, um, will the husbandman who is endued with intellect scatter such seeds as are most dear to him and from which he wishes fruit should arise? Will he scatter them in the summer in the gardens of Adonis with the greatest diligence and attention, rejoicing to behold them in beautiful protection within the, state of, within the space of eight days? Or rather, when he acts in this manner, Will he not do so for the sake of some festive day or sport? But when seriously applying himself to the business of agriculture, will he not sow where it is proper and be sufficiently pleased if the sowing receives its consummation, consummation within eight months? <coughs> so it implies that there's a timing to the, the rhetoric. The, say that last part again. Timing. That timing. But when, when. That's right. Right, because he uses that great example of eight months, doesn't he? Yeah. That whole paragraph leads to the need for a special timing for this. Right? Or a season or timing. As if the proper season. And also thinking of fitting. When to plant when to plant them is important but also to be pleased that it's going to take a proper amount of time instead of hurried along or hurried about in eight days. Yeah, eight months. So it takes some time yeah, if yeah. it's done properly. Yeah, right, right. You can't force it or encourage, so push it. And here... There's a, a, not a nurturing that takes place, but what's interesting about it? It does it by itself. It nurtures itself, doesn't it, in the paragraph we were into a moment ago. Oh, interesting, yeah. Right. Now, look here, we have to make a decision. So. Let's assume for the moment that this is a worthwhile paragraph. Would you not agree now, we look at other translations and see whether or not there's something different there that will draw our attention to something that one may have ignored or played down. So, anyone has a different translation, please let's jump to it and see what you'd like to add to it is different so that we can make a comparison. Because where we're going is, this should answer the question, shouldn't it? This will be pleasing to the gods. If what? If we end up being... Very happy about the whole deal. The extreme happiness brought about by this process, which is applying the dialectical method using these images so that we can go back into the text and line up exactly what he means by each of these things. Because this is a conclusion. And we also, of course, want to know from the text how you determine this key term, too. Fitting. Fitting, right? Where's the translation? He uses that same word in the paragraph we just read. Here he says a congenial the soul. In the, in the paragraph. Yeah, no, that Lyndon. Yeah, yeah. No, him. The, the soil has to be fitting. Yeah. The soil, he uses the word fitting. Yeah. He picks on that idea. Yeah. 
because clearly the dialectical method is going to have to deal with different kinds of speech for different kinds of souls and the proper appointment for each corresponding to their basic similarity. Right? There has to be a similarity between the kinds of speech and the kinds of soul, or a harmony, or a symmetry. And then from that, we still want to know, so what? Fitting. Here it says, and receiving a soul properly adapted for his purpose. No, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's another word. No, no, no. Fitting. You have to now say whether that advances something. Well, that Make a judgment. Well, it expands the idea of, or, or gives a view of what fitting is. It's a, it's a soul that... Okay, you're offering it from that translation? A soul that... Um, that the dial uh, that the dialectic art receives a soul that's fit um, properly adapted. Could you read it, please? Okay. Re let's see. When someone employing the dialectic art and receiving a soul properly adapted for his purpose. Properly adapted for its purpose. That's what he looks like means for fitting. Hold on. Properly adapted. Fitting, properly adapted for its purpose. Well, yeah. In this mysterious translation, he uses the word congenial, a congenial soul. Con I don't know who so the, so the translator might find the word congenial wraps this up for him. Who finds a congenial soul and then proceeds with true knowledge. That's fitting soul, fitting congenial Fitting soul, soul, congenial soul. Right. Yeah. Each, yeah. each one has a term that's... Yeah. Fitting and congenial Absolutely. is slightly different. Right? It takes on a different aspect, but nice basis of some similarity. Okay. Okay, then. Okay. Going back into the examples, we pulled out time as a difference. Uh, how about the gardens of letters? Remember that paragraph that... Uh, 276D. A very curious phrase. I wonder what you make of it. Let me read this one, all right? No, the gardens of letters, he will, it seems, plant for amusement and will write, when he writes, to treasure up reminders for himself when he comes to the forgetfulness of old age and for others who follow the same path he will be pleased when he sees them bringing forth tender leaves. Mm. What's that mean? Come on. See the language? Mm. And for others who follow the same path, not for those who are storing them up for their later years when they gain a certain forgetfulness, right? Not those. But for others who follow the same path, he will be pleased when he sees them putting forth tender leaves. Right. So when this goes on, when this goes on, the person will be aware of the, some growth going on, tender leaves, right? right? He's able to reflect and see tender leaves emerging. So, come on, let's get a couple. So, um, let 
Now, what about the seeds? Uh, what do you do with uh, 276C? <laughs> I was noting a, con a, a contrast between the two paragraphs that you just re we just read. That one is to help or, or to be as a reminder to to help the person in old age with respect to forgetfulness. But in the paragraph where you put it in this, there is a it's um, plants and sows in a fitting soul, um, intelligent words. Its goal, or what it does, is to spring um, spring up in other minds, other words, capable no. capable of continuing the process forever. It it ha uh, right. to bring right. let's see what is it, which right. make the possessor you, you, happy. Are you going to, between two paragraphs? Right, I was seeing there was a difference. <coughs> yeah, are you in, going back to the other point? What, or are you on two? The, the, the I was just looking. Paragraph at, I was just on. Oops. I thought that was what it was. Well, you seem to be going between two paragraphs. Will you please settle my confusion? Uh, well, 276, it looks like the goal in that uh, it, paragraph is to help the person be reminded, at, function as a reminder, and and to help in the forgetful, the forgetfulness yeah, of old that. age. Yeah. Okay. And others, and the I'm other taking one, the other part. And the other paragraph we re yeah. read... Its goal was to uh, continue the process which makes the possessor happy and to bring them to the furthest limits of happiness. Yeah, we, yeah. So that's different than using it yeah. Yeah. as See a reminder. See if I can get you back in, okay. in the paragraph we're in, okay? Okay, which one are you? 276 C. C. Oh, See, C. We're, I asked, shall we not get more about the seeds? That's where we were. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Hmm. All right. I missed that part of the screen reading. I didn't. Did we read okay. it? Okay. Everyone, take a look. What do you find? Hmm. Did we read that section? See, we're on the image of the seeds. We want to get more about it. He wants the seeds to yield a full crop. Oh. Oh. He wants it to develop into something bigger and better. And shall we suppose that he who has knowledge of the just, the good, and the beautiful has less sense about his seeds than the husbandman? By no means. Okay, turn that around then. Since it's put negatively, turn around positively which is what we all must, always must do with Plato. Then he who has knowledge of the just and the good and the beautiful will have more sense about his seeds than the husband. Yeah. He'll have more knowledge about what seeds to plant. Ah! So this dude here, who has helped, we now can add something about him. What does he have? Knowledge of the just, the good, and the beautiful. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Come on, don't mislead me. Good? Because these kinds of words about what about someone who has the knowledge of the just, the good, and the beautiful have that potentiality of when dropping into the soul of someone that it, they grow themselves, they have their own kind of productive and they also generate other seeds, and these other seeds, good heavens, they go on forever and bring about happiness. Mm -hmm. Wow. They produce their own fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> you like right. that image? I, I go, I go for that. Come on. Come okay. On. Look. Okay, how about the painting image? He didn't pick that up, but we can.
Right? We can put it in here. It's negative. Okay. So what do you see in the painting image? The painting image, would you agree, is uh, two seventy five D. Writing, Phaedrus, has this strange quality. And it's very, very like painting. It's very like painting. And so he continues. Right, so let's focus on that. Why is he using that strange example? Because it's not here, except in a disguised form. Painting isn't alive. I, this is husbandry works with um, live or by live living elements. Painting is a non-living element, and it doesn't doesn't um, doesn't go, grow. <coughs> There's not. An okay. element of nurture. Okay. okay. So you don't speak. Let, let's assume she's right. Okay? Okay, that's it. Unless you want to add something. Yeah? Uh, my footnote says zoographia painting or the art of painting has its roots alive, animals' life, and writing. Well, what did you say? Did you hear him? I couldn't hear him either. Did you hear him? Yeah. We don't care. You didn't say it loud enough, so we in the first row don't care. Oh, or we'd like you to say it louder so we can care. Come okay. on. I'm sorry, I was reading. Push the volume. Zoographia is the word in Greek. So what would you say is the point he's making about painting? There are several. The, the word in Greek uh, contains the word life, zoe. Well, it's like living beings. It has the appearance of life, but it's indeed it is yeah. flat. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Go ahead. Uh, I, I almost think we could we could make a multiple part analogy between the writing, the painting, and the rhetoric and the dialectic because. Uh, there's, in the, with the painting, you're taking something that's alive and you're, you're trying to create an image of it that is fixed and can no longer move. And uh, he says that that's what the writing is like compared to the, the words themselves that have some life to them. Okay, uh, interesting. Um, therefore, you'd say, come on, pull it together and we can use it. I don't know if I can do that. Okay. I, I put you in there. I suggested something. <laughs> so, are there two kinds of writing going on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What kind? The good and the bad. <laughs> Daniel, what do you think? Are there two kinds of writing, as it were? <laughs> yes. What are the two? Uh, you could write something that is uh, rhetoric. Uh, Watch, I'm playing with the word writing. Look here, this whole thing we're talking about, is this not writing in the soul? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm. oh, okay. Versus the other kind of writing and words. Is mm. he making a contrast? Yes. Yeah. 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 Ah, Would therefore I want to know what, therefore, what we can say about the one that we cannot say about the other. Therefore, we can take the negative, turn them into positive, wrap it up with a bundle one of has, flowers. One has power, the other doesn't. Power? One has power to protect itself. Power can protect itself. That's good. Thank you. Now we're going. The other one always needs its father. Right. One always needs its father. And it's thank you. Silence. 
Is that important in that section, in that paragraph? Yes. No dialogue, right? The other one, therefore, has a voice, right? It doesn't have the appearance of life. It has life. It has intelligence, right? It has power to perfect itself, protect itself. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Self-regenerating. Open to? Self-regenerating. Self yeah. Uh, so, you see how he's using language now? You see, we have to take it because he's talking about writing and he's telling you the weaknesses about it. Then we take it over here and say, hey, you know what? If he's talking about two kinds of writing, one writing in the soul and one writing with words, silence. Oh, then over here, ha <laughs> ha, dialogue, <coughs> words, spoken written, right? Mm -hmm. Only the appearance of life. Over here then, right? It's consistent, <laughs> is it not? Wait a minute. It's not just we're adding. It's consistent with this and it dramatizes a certain part of it. That's why we were going back to see if we can find more things there than that is contained here, because it is here in minuscule. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's where we, we will, of course, time will, fitting appropriate <laughs> Um, that's a question of whether or not time, but back into it. Okay, therefore, would you not agree? We've got a good paragraph there. The creatures of painting stand like living beings, but if one asks them a question, they preserve a solemn silence. <coughs> and so it is with written words. You might think they spoke as if they had intelligence. But if you question them, wishing to know about their sayings, they always say only one and the same thing. And every word when it is written is bandied about, alike among those who understand and those who have no interest in it. And it knows not to whom to speak or not to speak when ill-treated or unjustly reviled, it always needs its father to help it, for it has no power to protect or help itself. Therefore, if this is the weak side, remember dialectic always has the left and the right, it's always balanced. This is an example of it. He's using the art of rhetoric right here in this small section. Right? Appearance and reality. Right and left. Right? Hmm. So in this paragraph, if you take each point he's making, those words that are written is like a painting. Line up each of the, see, line them up. One, two, three, line them up. And then look for their corresponding part on the other. And you see he's playing with words in a very nice way. Right? Going from the... Analogy. From that, we can create the analogy. He's giving us the metaphor. We unpack the metaphor. We see all the things that are short about words when words are looked upon like paintings. Oh, take up all those negatives. Therefore, I switch them over here positively. Does it not appear consistent? Oh, it is. Does it add something? Yeah. Oh. So, look, another, okay, try on. Um. The idea of timing, we touched on that. Would you agree at 276B, there's a whole paragraph on timing. What else can we add to it, just by taking a look at it? <coughs> Would not a philosophical husband, none, right? Hmm. Hmm. Changing a word or two. Mm -hmm. Who has seeds, which he cares for. Hey, what do you got to do? <laughs> Care for these seeds, right? Therefore, these things over here have to care for these words that are implanted. You've got to care for them. 
Oh. Because he, he knows they're going to bear fruit, so he's caring for them. He's using, as it were, midwifery, you know, the language of raising children, right? Mm -hmm. And he cares for them. He wishes them to bear fruit. Plants them with serious purpose. Oh! When the dude is doing it, he knows that he's doing it. Serious purpose. Oh, it adds to the planter, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? So now this is, of course, the negative, so we turn it around positive, doesn't it? But let's take the negative. The heat of summer, some garden of Adonis, and delight in seeing them appear in beauty in eight days? That's quick. Or would he do that sort of thing when he did it at all? Only in play and for amusement? Would he not? Positive side. When he was in earnest... Follow the rules of husbandry, plant his seeds in fitting ground, and, and be pleased when those which he had sowed reach their perfection in the eighth month. Right? See? Does that add to the seeds and planting? See? There's a richness to the metaphor. And we can take a couple of those words. It highlights, does it not? Care, careful, proper, fitting, not quick. Right? They're going to take a full term, eight months. Why did he use eight instead of nine? Oh, okay. We well, took eight months back then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, look here, see. Maybe there's no words beyond eight. See, and he plea, and he is, and he, and be pleased when those with which he had sowed. Right, this is this person now. He's going to be pleased when those that he has planted in someone else has reached perfection. Ah, that's what he says. It's going to have two effects, both on the person and on himself. So here we have how he was going to be pleased and why. Because those seeds are going to reach perfection in someone else. Is that right? Don't mislead me. No, okay, okay, sure. Some people are taking notes, that's why I want to make sure. But well, why eight months? I don't, what, what, what? I don't understand why eight months. I still don't understand Whose question was it, yours or mine? <laughs> Come on. Here. Come on. No, it was your question. All right. You haven't answered it yet, or at least I haven't understood it. Well, I'm not going to give you mine. <coughs> any midwife will tell you. Uh, <laughs> any midwife who has, you know, her uh, experience will tell you that a child after eight months has a better chance of living than before. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. I'll take that for now. Okay. Now look, see, but this is where you can have fun with Plato. Why did he use eight instead of nine? It's a big point that was made a moment ago, but that means we have to go outside of the text to make sense of something that we find modestly curious. Mm -hmm. I didn't say seven or six. Well, yeah, the, hold the on. Same, the same is true for seven months with a baby. They're, yeah. they're, they're, it's more likely they'll live after seven months than before. Okay, see, the point would be, is there any place in the text itself that would throw light on this mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. so that we don't have to go outside of the text? And if so, let's find it. So you mark it, see, you put it over here. And you say, things to do, things to look for. <laughs> At the end, if you don't have it, you know he goofed. Right? You don't have to believe Plato. Thank I'm, goodness. I'm thinking of Parmenides and the eight hypotheses. There's only one. <laughs> <laughs> one and <eight>. there are nine. <laughs> nine. 
Or if you think of Meno, after all, Meno had a, uh, pardon me, Zeno had a hypothesis, did he not? So there are ten. Or there are one. Or there are eight. Or there are nine. Or there are ten. Either way, there's eight. Yeah, because he also says, uh, or one, Dave. Um. Now, in the same way, um, um, see, let's assume for the moment that we're pretty good with this section. Right? Now you turn it around and you say, hey, you know what? What paragraph did we miss? And let's see whether it's just a transition paragraph or whether we skipped one that has some meaning that we didn't spot. See? Turn it against it. Come on, turn it again, see? Remember now, we're working on this assumption, right, which is a um, thesis of rhetoric, right, right and left. We're working on <coughs> the assumption that what is said about writing has a parallel in the soul on a higher and more profound level. So therefore, we just have to go through and look for anything about writing that we missed and see whether there is something there that, in fact, we can address ourselves to and see its parallel here that we might have missed. That's reading. He mentions... Right? Now you go back and you look for things you may have, we may have skipped and see whether we can... Because I'm for... Uh, Lisa has brought uh, tonight a stack of scissors and she's going to s distribute them so we can cut out the sections of Plato that don't fit yeah. and are not serving any purpose. Right, Lisa? Yep, we're going to hang them on right. we're Oh, okay. I just thought I'd ask. Well, I can't find well, it in calls, the text. He calls uh, this, this then would be called... What, uh, what number? Uh, 275A, uh, 275, right around there. He talks about uh, right, the, the function of... 275, uh, what? 275, at 275, just above that. A? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that whole section is absurd. Good. Right, uh, now this is this is going to be fun. Okay. Because uh, so so um, uh, where uh, most ingenious to it, the the one man who has the ability to beget arts, but the ability to judge of their usefulness or harmness, harmfulness to their users belongs to another. Yes. Yes. And now you, who are the father of letters, have been led by your affection to ascribe them the power the opposite of which they really possess. For this invention you will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn to use it, because they will not practice their memory. Their trust in writing produced by all external characters which are no part of themselves, will discourage the use of their memory within them. You have in invented an exler not of memory, but of reminding. You offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom. Right, so... Uh, 
then we could we could line up on the right. This is true wisdom then. Right. And this is and, and if you line up each of those points he's asserting, then you are adding, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Look here. I suspect you have a good passage. Mm -hmm. Therefore, why don't you go on for the next two paragraphs of Socrates and tell us what you see? Because these two are major. Go ahead. Very curious, too. Go ahead. Of Socrates? Yeah. Um, I, I better rewrite him. Too slowly. They used to say, my friend, that the words of the oak in the holy place of Zeus at Dodona were the first pro prophetic utterances. The people of that time, not being so wise as you young folks, were content in their simplicity to hear an oak or a rock provided only it spoke the truth. But to you, perhaps, it makes a difference who the speaker is and where he comes from. For you do not consider only whether his words are true or not. And then the next one is, He who thinks, then, that he has left behind any art in writing and who receives it in the belief that anything in writing will be clear and certain would be an utterly simple person, and in truth ignorant of the prophecy of Ammon. <coughs> if he thinks written words are of any use except to remind him who knows the matter about which they are written. So what is weak about written words he's adding that we haven't found before? They're only useful to the ignorant. No. Simple. Simple minded. Yeah, I'll turn you into a lock. Hey. Non-thinker. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, they're, they don't have, the art of using them doesn't have within it the ability to judge how to use it. No, that's true. Try to take it general. I always agree when it's general. Um, I go for something specific from the text. I bet we can get something better. Want right, a better nickel? Want a better nickel? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. If if you just take uh, <coughs> well, if you just take all of those things we said about writing and apply them to the to the soul, then you have uh, you can see all of the problems we have today. In, political speech or anything else, that, that everything, it's about how people are. <coughs> yeah, to I what totally doing. agree. Didn't help. <laughs> All right. So, um, no, no, I totally agree with you. I always agree. That's why I'm called Pierre the Agreeable. I think it's what's written is only really clear to the writer himself, because nobody can really know what the truth behind it is, unless you know the Yeah, you hear that? No. no, the heck with her. <laughs> no. Unless we can get her to talk louder. I think what's written is, is really only evidently clear to the writer himself knowing what he was writing at the time. Otherwise, everyone else that's reading what's written is truly ignorant because they don't have the okay. state of mind or the okay. true meaning. Give her a C. Black, black okay. Okay. Got a little bit in the text, but what the heck, you take what you can get, you know. <laughs> right? Yeah, not bad. Not good, but not bad. <laughs> okay, what I want to know is what in the soul is uh, equivalent with the, the memory, that this art of writing will also diminish memory in those who use it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> see, we're having fun, see. <laughs> we're contemplating. Now, wait a while, okay? Let me turn it around, all right? Let me read the same paragraph. <clears throat> he who thinks then that he has left behind him any art in writing and he who receives it in the belief that anything in writing will be clear and certain would be an utterly simple person and a truth ignorant of the prophecy of Ammon. What does he think? This stuff is what? Clear and certain. 
It is not what? Not clear and certain. Not clear and certain. Hey, these have to be? Clear and certain. Clear and certain. Oh. You gave us, see, you gave us one part of it. Right? And therefore it can go from a C to an A, can't it? But, see, there's a hidden part to this, you see. He refers to the prophecy of Ammon. Therefore, we have to go back and pick that up to understand this paragraph, don't we? Right? Because, hey, huh, there's a very often quoted section about the prophecy of Ammon. And, um, anyone have it so we can save some time? It's a long one. Well, okay. Okay, look. We have done our, we have tried this model. Was it worth it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to go through now the art of rhetoric next time from this point that he has it at the point of origin to this point, all right? We may not get through it, but we'll try it. See the way we're approaching? Because he's got a very beautiful and skillful metaphor, doesn't he? That is, and symmetrical, isn't it? Weak, strong. Points here, transfer here. Writing here on paper, writing here in the soul. Now, by the way, wouldn't it be interesting if there's prophecy on one side and not on the other? But don't... Yeah. You know, time to have coffee, isn't it? Good. Thank you. Fun? Thank you. Also, I'm here if you want a penny donation.